Somerset Mendip Circuit, Digital Worship for the 14th of February 2021. This week, led by Fiona Smith. Hello and welcome to our virtual service for Sunday the 14th of February. We begin with a call to worship. Praise, praise be to God, who loves us with an everlasting love, whose wisdom is beyond telling, whose glory knows no bounds, who calls us to follow and turns our darkness into light. Blessed be God for ever. Amen. We join together in praising God as we sing our first hymn, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light inaccessible, it from our eyes, most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Unresting, unhasting, as silent as light, nor wanting, nor wasting, thou rulest in might. Thy justice like mountains, thy soaring above, thy clouds which are fountains of goodness and love. To all life thou givest, to both great and small, in all life thou livest, the true life of all. We blossom and flourish as leaves on the tree, and wither and perish, but naught changeth thee. Great Father of glory, pure Father of light, thine angels adore thee, all veiling their sight. All praise we would render, O oh, help us to see, tis only the splendor of life hideth thee. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light inaccessible, it from our eyes, most blessed, most glorious, the ancients of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Let us pray in adoration and praise to God. Holy God, to you alone belong glory, honour and praise. We join with the hosts of heaven as we worship. You alone are worthy of adoration from every mouth and every tongue shall sing your praise. You create the earth by your power. You save the human race in your mercy and renew it through your grace. To you, loving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all glory, honour and praise, now and forever. Amen. Prayers of Thanksgiving. Let us think, give thanks to God for the love of our father and mother, the maker of all, the giver of all good things, let us, let us bless and thank the Lord. For the world's beauty and the changing seasons, 
and for the life that we have been given. Let us bless and thank the Lord. For Jesus Christ, our Saviour, who lived and worked among us, let us bless and thank the Lord. For his suffering and death on the cross and his resurrection to new life, let us bless and thank the Lord. For his rule over all things and his presence in the world, let us bless and thank the Lord. For the Holy Spirit, the giver of life, who teaches and guides us, let us bless and thank the Lord. For the grace of the Spirit, in the work of the church and the life of the world, let us bless and thank the Lord. Amen. We say together the prayer that Jesus gave us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. God, yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory. And we catch just a glimpse of that glory revealed to Elijah and Elisha in today's reading, which we will now hear. So the read today is from 2 Kings, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to 14. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha had set out from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. Elisha replied, as the Lord lives your life upon it, I shall not leave you. They went down to the country of Bethel. And there a company of prophets came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your Lord and Master from you today? I do know, he replied. Say nothing. Elijah said to him, Stay here, Elisha, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. He replied, As the Lord lives, your life upon it. I shall not leave you. So they went to Jericho, and there a company of prophets came up to Elisha and said to him, Do you know the Lord is going to take your Lord and Master from you today? I do know, he replied, say nothing. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here. For the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. The other replied, As the Lord lives, your life upon it, I shall not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty of the prophets followed and stood watching from a distance as the two of them stopped by the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and left, and both crossed over to dry ground. While they were crossing, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Elisha said, Let me inherit a double share of your spirit. You have asked a hard thing, said Elijah. If you see me taken from you, your wish will be granted. If you do not, it will not be granted. They went on talking as they went, and suddenly there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, which separated them from one another. And Elijah was carried up to heaven in a whirlwind. At the sight, Elijah cried out, my father, my father, 
the chariot and the horsemen of Israel, and he saw him no more. He clutched hold of his mantle and tore it in two. He picked up the cloak which had fallen from Elijah and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. There he struck the water with Elijah's cloak, saying as he did so, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? As he too struck the water, it divided to the right and left and he crossed over. Amen. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all who hear be acceptable to you, our hope, our guide and our God. Amen. I love today's reading. It seems to me so very human, full of familiar characters, the harassed teacher just trying to get some time to themselves, the overeager student whose stubbornness seems to know no bounds, and the know-it-all busybodies pointing out the obvious. Not mansplaining, perhaps, but certainly prophet-splaining. Evidence, if ever we needed it, that while lots has changed in the past few thousand years, people certainly haven't. But out of all the interesting characters that we find in this story, the character I want to focus on in my reflections today is Elisha, this apprentice prophet, determinedly following his teacher wherever he goes. Now, we're not told how Elijah felt about Elisha's stubborn refusal to leave him alone, whether his requests that Elisha remain behind are some sort of test or a genuine attempt to escape his company. But whether Elijah was secretly proud of Elisha or incredibly frustrated with him, as readers looking back, you've got to admire his tenacity. I don't know how many of you would be willing to challenge your mentor's instructions, not once, but three times in a row, but I'm not sure that I'd have the guts to do it. Then, there's the matter of the journey that Alicia is volunteering to go on. This is no easy afternoon walk between neighbouring villages. Estimates differ for how many miles they'd need to walk to go from Gilgal to Bethel to Jericho to the River Jordan and beyond. But the estimates I've seen range from 25 to 45 miles, further definitely than I'd volunteer to walk in a day. That's for sure. And I'm not sure that that would change, even knowing that Elijah only had a day left to live. However much I'd want to, to treasure the time we had left together, I'm not sure that would overpower my wish to be sitting comfortably at home, abiding by my master's wishes. But Elisha is determined, so much so that he refuses to leave Elijah's side, as long as he lives. And again, that's no easy promise. We're told that Elisha knows, or at least suspects, that this will be Elijah's last day on earth. But even so, to promise something for the rest of someone's life, however short you think that might be, is not something to be taken lightly. It's a sign of commitment unlike any other. Think about the lifelong commitments you may have made, maybe to your church or to a partner or to your children. I'd be surprised if you couldn't count them on the fingers of your hands. So, Elisha is committed to Elijah. He's determined to stick with him to the very end. But why? Is it for his sake or for Elijah's? And if he does hope to gain something from this display of stubbornness, what might that be? The answer, or at least part of it, comes when Elijah, having finally allowed Elisha to 
follow him all the way to the other side of the Jordan, finally asks him, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? And Elisha replies, Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. It seems to me that in his dogged refusal to let Elijah out of his sight, Elisha is refusing to settle for being less of Elijah's disciple than he could be, and that in his request to Elijah, asking for dub a double portion of his spirit, the portion normally given to a man's heir, Elisha is refusing to settle for being anything less than Elijah's true successor. He's refusing to be any less of a prophet than Elijah was, a man favoured by God, who spoke truth to power, confronting kings and generals, and at whose words God rained down fire and even gave life. He sees the relationship Elijah has with God and is refusing to settle for anything less. And if we think about the rest of the Bible, Elisa isn't the only one who refuses to settle. The example that immediately sprung to mind for me was Jacob. Jacob, the patriarch, who famously wrestled with God through the night, holding on to this mysterious stranger, even after his hip was broken, and refusing to let him go until he blessed him. He refused to settle for anything less than God's blessing, and he wasn't going to give up until he had it. And throughout the Bible, we find evidence that to those who refuse to give up, those who keep following, keep wrestling, keep asking and keep trying, God reveals himself and gives them his blessing. The Gospel reading set for today which we haven't heard, is also evidence of this. To the disciples, Peter, James and John, who have dropped everything to follow this little-known prophet around the countryside and finally up a mountain, they are rewarded with a vision of Jesus transfigured, a vision of his hidden glory and the glory that he will return to. Their willingness to give everything up to follow Jesus means that they have been blessed with a vision to sustain them through the tough times ahead. A vision that when coupled with the words of Jesus in John 14 verse 12, Truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father, and I will do exact whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son, makes you wonder exactly what they, and by extension we, might be capable of if only we ask Jesus for help, if we don't settle for less. So let me ask you a question. Are there times in your life when you've settled? Settled for adequate instead of good, maybe? Settled for something close enough to what you were looking for. Settled for a no, as a yes seemed far too far away to be able to grasp. I know I have. In fact, I might even go so far as to say I do it all the time. Especially when it comes to things like cooking or finding something to listen to on my computer. We know that the world is imperfect. We know our own limits, and we settle for that. We listen to the naysayers, the voices telling us that poverty is inevitable, might is right, and hatred unavoidable, that our God isn't powerful enough, or simply doesn't care enough, to cure the world of its ills, or to cure our sick friends, that his miracles are limited to the realms of history. And we are tempted to let go of the hope to which we are called and forget the love and power of the God who called us and settle for a faith that is less. A faith that is less challenging, allowing us to avoid the difficult questions, 
less loving, and less at odds with the world around us. And if you see something of yourself in that description, know that you're not alone. I know, as I said, that I settle too easily. I like to take the easy road, let things slide if I can't be bothered to argue, take rest when it's offered. And don't get me wrong, I don't think that there's anything wrong with rest. Recharging our batteries is important, and as we may have heard in our lectionary reading last week, even Jesus needed to do it sometimes. But there is a difference between taking a break and simply giving up. And there are some things that you can take a break from, and some things that you can't. Taking a break from housework? Yes, definitely. Taking a break from being a law-abiding member of society? Not so much. Taking a break from homeschooling your children? Yes. Taking a break from loving them? Probably not. Taking a break from a particular church role? Yes. Taking a break from your relationship with God? Not something that I would recommend. And it's the same with settling. There are some things we can settle for. A less than perfect bowl of macaroni cheese, for example. If we didn't, I know I'd probably die of starvation trying to get it right. But there are other things we simply shouldn't settle for, such as a relationship with God where we don't expect anything from him on the proviso that he expects nothing from us either. And we shouldn't allow others to convince us otherwise. When we come to God for answers, struggle with him and refuse to let him go, we might not get the answer that we want or the miracle that we want, but we will get an answer and we will be changed for the better by the encounter. This week, we mark the beginning of Lent, a time of reflection, prayer and fasting, when traditionally people give up things that they perceive as creating barriers in their relationship with God. After a year such as this, where we have already given up so much that we might previously have taken for granted, perhaps instead we should take some time to pray and reflect and consider if there is a task or an area of your life where God is calling you not to settle. It might be a particular political issue. It might be that you refuse to settle for being less than loving towards someone that you find difficult. It might be that you refuse to settle for the knowledge of God that you have already, instead choosing to explore deeper. In doing this, I don't mean that you have to do this particular thing perfectly, rather that you don't give it any less than your best, and that you don't give up. That is, I think, all that God ever asks of us. So this Lent, let's be more like Elisha, more like Jacob and Jesus's first disciples. Let's not settle for anything less than seeing God in all his glory, with continuing to wrestle with him in our doubt and when we have questions, and with doggedly following him to the very end of our strength. Let's not settle for a God who is less than almighty, who is less than love eternal, incarnate and active. Let's not settle for a gospel that's less than good news for the poor, recovery of sight to the blind and freedom to the prisoners and the oppressed. And let's not settle for living lives that are anything less than extraordinary, spirit filled, prayerful, and full of love, by the grace of God. Amen. And we're going to sing again now the timeless classic, Who Would True Valor See? There's no discouragement shall make him once relent his first avowed intent to be a pilgrim. <laughs>
Let us pray. Almighty, loving and merciful God, we thank you that your power is greater than we can comprehend and your love for us is beyond our wildest imaginings. We thank you that you care enough to choose us, to walk alongside us, to die for us, and to raise us to life with you. We're sorry for the times when we forget, or allow ourselves to be persuaded otherwise. We're sorry for the times when we shrink you to fit our own agendas, and turn your good news into anything but, with complications and conditions that are impossible to meet. And we're sorry for the times when we settle for less of you and less of your spirit than that which you offer freely. Forgive us, God, and help us to be a pilgrim people, ever striving to see you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day, and refusing to settle for anything less. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God is love, and with love comes forgiveness. So to all who are sorry, know that your sins are forgiven through the love of Christ. Amen. But it's not just us whom God loves, but the whole world. And so we bring our prayers now to God for the world and all its people. Let us pray. Almighty God, you created this beautiful planet on which we live and gave it into our care. And too often we are too slow to protect it from our greed and indifference and the greed and indifference of others. And so we pray for those who do fight to protect it, who see your vision of a world where humanity lives in harmony with nature rather than exploiting it and refuse to settle for anything less. We pray that we may be like them too. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, you placed us within the rich diversity of the whole human family, and yet we have allowed ourselves to be torn into warring tribes. We are complicit in the exploitation of others and the sowing of division. 
Too often we are too slow to stand up for the needs of our brothers and sisters, too slow to speak out for peace, and too slow to champion solidarity with one another. And so we pray for those who do stand up for their neighbours, in this country and beyond, who see your vision of a world overflowing with peace and justice, and refuse to settle for anything less. We pray that we may be like them too. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, you made us in your image, able to dream and hope and love. But we are not like you, and our minds become tired and confused, and our bodies are injured and decay. And so we pray for all those known to us, who are sick in body, mind or soul, and are in need of your loving presence and healing. Too often, God, our concern ends with our prayers, and so we pray too for those who work for the healing of others, who comfort, reassure and walk alongside those who need it, those who see your vision of a world with no more tears and refuse to settle for anything less. We pray that we may be like them too. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty, loving and holy God, hear these our prayers, spoken and unspoken, and grant that we might live to see them answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our final hymn calls us to live out our faith the way we preach it, that we may see the future we pray for. Community of Christ, who make the cross your own, live out your creed and risk your life for God alone. Be peace. 
praise and Christ did sung. A currency beloved and kindliness alone. A food and faith be shared as one for Go in peace, confident of God's love for you, and resolve to do his will, and the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you all evermore. Amen. <laughs>